And so here we are. We're back at uh, ZeroCon 23. It's just coming up to, I think, five o'clock for the closing day. I am here with the amazing Susan Scott Parker, um, a mentor and a dear friend. And for me, one of the leaders in disability business inclusion. Now, you look very serious, but can I have your mic? Because it's green and it matches my suit better than yours. Yeah, so here we go. That'll just show you. Susan, you and I have an absolute shared passion. I say it, inclusive business creates inclusive societies, and we will never be ever able to end the exclusion crisis facing people with disabilities without business at the table. Now, you say we are going to fail. We fail disabled people when we fail to also meet the needs of business. And what is really at the premise of that is that business are the solution. And we look to not serve business, but make it easier for business, rather than seeing business as the problem. And it is up to us to do that. So maybe just talk us through a little bit of your thinking and your journey to here, because you have been in the space for 33 years. And you've, have you seen changes, are things changing? So the idea was that we would have a conversation, and you've just asked me five questions I have, all at me. once. Yeah, but that, now okay. this is going to be complicated. Go for it. You can take your favorite the, question. Well, my favorite question then is, I'm actually not talking about business as the solution. I'm saying that if we, in terms of economic empowerment strategies, if we continue to treat the business that treat business as the problem, we're not going to make any big breakthrough in terms of getting significantly more disabled people into work. At the moment, the system that's trying to help disabled people to prepare for and find jobs um, is justifies its failure to get more disabled people into work by blaming the employer. It's always the employer that is the problem. We're only, go we're only going to see a big breakthrough when we start to see the, the the organizations that are funded to help disabled people to get work, actually positioning the employer as a valued service user mm -hmm. and potential partner. And so, um, you know, over the years since I launched that little phrase of disability confidence, you know, I know it's you're your going to phrase. say, it, yeah, you're going to say it was a hundred years ago. It's it was not only hundred 20 years ago, 20. but it's a phrase that's been used and has so much more relevance now today because the disability community have the confidence to say that we have value to business and helping business use that value or benefit from that value. Well, when I, when I launched this little phrase, I meant that a disability confident business would understand the impact of disability and its performance on the business. They would be barrier free for groups of people, you know, ramps, etc. make adjustments for individuals so you get disability equality because mm -hmm. you can't have inclusion without equality. No. We seem to forget that. Yeah. And you don't make assumptions about what people can do on the basis of a label, particularly disability. So we have seen progress in terms of more and more companies beginning to understand that they, when they deliver the business improvements that also benefit disabled people, everybody wins a balloon. But we still need to build the business confidence of the disability community. Mm -hmm. All too often, people who are working with disabled people have no experience of the private sector. They don't understand what the private sector can reasonably be expected to do, how they define best practice. And they don't provide, they don't make it easy for business to actually attract suitable candidates with the skills they require to fill particular vacancies. So the image would be in a kind of a job market, you've got the interventions that push people at the world of work in general, the kind mm -hmm. of supply of talent, and hope they magically find an, a vacancy at the end of the trail. And you've got interventions that help a particular employer to attract suitable disabled talent to fill particular vacancies. That chunk is usually missing in most job markets. All the attention for disabled people is focused just on them as individuals, not on helping the employer learn how to get it right and actually attract suitable candidates. So we're talking about building the business confidence of the disability community while building the disability confidence of the business community and bringing the two much more closely together. There's too big a divide between the two sectors. Yeah, it's like we're on opposite sides of the fence. Absolutely. Uh, we talk about creating cult these cultures, the cultures around where there's trust, mutual trust, right, on both sides of the fence. One of the things that I'm really still fascinated with it. We have 80% of disabled people are have an invisible disability. And we estimate one in three people in our companies have a connection to disability. Yep. And 
would that not be a great step forward in helping the employers have the confidence if they can get people to disclose about their connection to disability? Well, <clears throat> I don't think that's where I'd start. I'd start by saying, how do we get more dialogue between people in business and people with disabilities? So that would include talking to their own people, but it includes talking to leaders in the disability community around them, mm -hmm. include talking to your disabled customers. Yeah. It's getting a better understanding on both sides, because the point I'm making today is that the disability community needs to understand business. That's the big gap. And yes, we can encourage the employers to talk and learn from disabled people. But if the disability community, whether it's the NGOs that are actually funded to help disabled people into work or the OPDs, if they don't understand the world of business, then how on earth are they going to help their job seekers to actually work in that universe? So you're literally flipping it all on its head rather than business learning about the, dis the disability experience you're challenging us now to say, no, we need to learn about business and Absolutely. the challenges and the barriers that business face with, it, dis with disability or not, That's right? Same. I mean, I was looking at something from a disability organization the other day, and it expected a company with 350,000 employees to train every single manager around the world in some unexplained set of competencies called awareness. What, what's realistic about that? What company in the world is going to suddenly commit to training 300,000 people. So what would, your, what would your solution or what would your, your advice be? Like, how, how would you do it differently? Well, I would start by um, offering the opportunity for people in the disability community, and I say this meaning the NGOs as well as the yeah. OPDs, yeah, to actually spend time inside local companies getting to know people, getting you know the open house, the dialogue, the conversation going, what's it like in your world, what's it like in mine? What prevents you from finding suitable disabled candidates? How could we make it easier for you? The bottom line here is if we don't make it easier for the employer to say yes, I will hire you, we continue to make it needlessly difficult for the job seeker to get a job. Only the employer has the power to say yes, I will hire you. So the employer is the most important customer they have, you could argue. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of customer, one of the things that has frustrated me over the years, when we talk about disability in business, we often go through the lens of the job seeker on employment, and we are still leaving the customer experience out or the supply chain and, and procurement. Is that not also an opportunity for, for us to learn either sides of the coin? Absolutely. And actually what we do know is that when you remove obstacles for the customers, you're making it easy on the employment front. Your buildings start to work better for customers while they're working better for employees. And there was that lovely story some years ago in the UK where a company that trained all their frontline people in their shops to welcome disabled customers started to get really good applicants from the deaf community because the deaf customers were saying, well, if you value me as a customer, you might even hire me. And so they started to come in as employees only to discover their team members had been trained to look at you when you lip read because they were trained to look at their customers. Yeah. So it's a virtuous circle. And it's something that the disability sector, if you like, that's focused on jobs, uh, loses out on. They're missing a trick if they don't also help those customers um, to have the dialogue with the employers that is starting to say removing obstacles for customers is good for business, it's good for everybody. The sole focus on employment in conversations with companies, as I say, is missing a trick. So, I mean, I'm passionate about leadership from the top, right? That's a big thing, particularly with the Valuable 500, making sure disabilities at C-suite and board level. When you're talking about the disability community learning about business, I also think it's really important for them to learn about the huge <coughs> um, challenges facing leadership, because that's where it goes. And, how do, you, how do we close that gap? How do we make that happen, those conversations, those connections happen? Making sure that leadership is also part of that conversation. Well, one approach I've seen is the mentoring yeah. idea, but you've got senior leaders in the business mentoring leaders in the disability community as either social entrepreneurs or change agents. So you get the two-way learning. Mm -hmm. Um, opening their in-house management training to leaders with disabilities in the community who can come in to the three-day marketing course that Company X is running for their own managers so that you start to just get the experiential learning of people going in and out of each other's territory. 
um, Enable India had that program yeah. 1000, yeah. where you got points for actually going out to the disability community and experiencing their world. Well, I'd like to see that flipped so that you bring people with disabilities into the business community, experience their world, and everybody should be getting points somehow for that. That's a great initiative. It could be like like side B of you know the Absolutely A type of the right. record. Yeah. Um, for you, I mean, you've been on this journey for quite some time. What is some of the key areas of improvement that you've seen that actually give us that motivation that things are changing or that energy or hope? And on the other side, if you were queen of the world for the day, what would you change? That's two questions, Susan. It is only two. I can I know, cope I with two. Well. Yeah, I, I can cope with two. Um, I think what is changing is an understanding on the part of business that they have to learn directly from and with disabled people. So the purple light up movement, purple space, the ERGs, the disabled employee networks, starting to play a real role, what they call change from the inside out. Mm -hmm. um, it challenges the assumption that all disabled people are unemployed naturally, mm -hmm. and that's what they are. It starts to break down assumptions. And of course, when you get that leader to leader conversation going internally, people talking to each other as peers rather than the employer talking, not talking to people with disabilities at all. That's been a big breakthrough. I should probably say Valuable 500's been a breakthrough, but <laughs> I won't. Well, thank you very much. Well, I didn't that's pay right. you, we won't that's go okay. there. The other thing, though, about the, what's still the challenge is making workplace adjustments, is learning how to adapt for individuals. Um, and what we don't have is real expertise in the disability community on how to advise fairly large organizations on how to structure creating a workplace adjustment service that gives every employee, including disabled people, the tools and flexibility that they require. It's still a gap. It's still all ad hoc. And, and so we need to build the competence of the disability sector in how to advise the business community on designing systems that are are actually going to deliver workplace adjustments efficiently, quickly, on a trust basis. You don't have to prove you have a disability. Yeah. You just get the tools you need to do the job. Because I, w I think the one positive, that if there was anything positive out of the pandemic, we did see within 17 days the business system changed and everybody needed adjustments and accommodations, right? So that's something to build upon. But can you give me one example of a company that is doing that really well? Because it's, I think it's really important for us to understand there are wins and there Absolutely. are organizations. GSK. GSK is a global council, the Global Disability Confidence Council. They have understood that you need to put accountability at the very top if you're going to get consistent, fair, proper treatment of disabled people in every country in which you operate. And the only way you can deliver disability equality in every country in which you operate is if you deliver workplace adjustments efficiently on a basis of trust. And so Andy Garrett has been leading that work and they're rolling out that program on a global basis with the support of Microlink. Um, and, and what they have found is that their own people aren't trying to cheat them when they ask for adjustments. They had an appeal group for a while, but they didn't need it because people were asking for what they really needed in order to do their jobs well. So the trust-based processes work to treat, and they've now got waiting times down from, I don't know, months when they started to like 20 days on average. Mm -hmm. So the challenge to any one of your members is, if you take longer than 20 days to deliver an adjustment that an employee needs in Indonesia, Brazil, or New York, mm -hmm. well, it's not working properly, is it? But GSK can actually talk the talk and show you how to do that. And I think, you know, just as we come to the end, it, we're here at the Zero Conference, and it's the power of collaboration and sharing and learning from each other what does and does not work. Um, you know, the Business Disability Forum was a network. Um, and for organizations and for individuals, can you just speak to the power of the network in closing those gaps that you've discussed and in also being able to scale the opportunity of change and how to get involved in a network? Well, if. The, if um, we have any, anyone from the business community listening or watching, uh, if you don't have a business disability network in your patch, you need one. Um, w why would you want to start in year one when you could start in year 20? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. It's business coming together to joint fund something which makes it easier for all the members to drive progress on this. 
you certainly don't want to work in isolation, wasting your time. But it also means you can leverage your collective influence on yeah. the dysfunctional job markets. These job markets are failing disabled people because they fail business. It just doesn't work properly. Any job market which makes it needlessly difficult to attract from the widest possible talent pool is a, a dysfunctional job market. And only the business community can create job markets that work better for everybody. And at that point, I think that's a great point to mic drop Susan Scott Parker. I know that you will be more than happy to discuss or to talk to anybody on advice about setting up networks. Um, you are you are the expert. So I just want to say a huge thank you to Susan Scott Parker. Thank you to Susan Scott Parker. And signing off Caroline Casey in her green suit. And I'm pink. I'm pink. What's this green thing? Are we done? <laughs>